So let's um, now turn to that patient that you've made the diagnosis and <clears throat> they now have four drugs from which to choose based on the IRIS trial, imatinib, and SDND led to a nilotinib approval, decision trial to disatinib, and most recently, the BEFORE trial, which you published in JCO recently, um, led to the approval of basutinib. Mm -hmm. So we have four drugs. How do you choose between these? And I'm not gonna let you say whichever the insurance company tells you you can prescribe. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we that's sometimes important. that's the answer, yes. but, uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll not answer that way. Um, the, the first question that I, that I want to answer is, do I want imatinib or do I want a second generation TKI? All of these studies that you mentioned have shown us that with the second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you get deeper responses, you get faster responses, you actually get more responses um, and, and uh, a lower rate of transformation. The proportions vary and you know, there's the, you know, but, but in general that is, that is the case. Second generation have those benefits against imatinib. They don't give you a survival advantage, or at least they haven't so far, um, and, and they don't give you a progression-free survival, uh, an, an event-free survival, um, but, but that, that's probably not that unrealistic, considering that with imatinib, you do get a high cytogenetic response rate, and with that, the survival already goes pretty close to the, to the, the normal life expectancy. Uh, but there's all these other benefits, including the lower risk of transformation. So that's my first decision. In general, I prefer to, to, to go with the second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors because I value those benefits for the patient, not only for the immediate benefit that that confers, but for the long term, and we're gonna talk more about that. Then, which one of the three? I have the satinib, the lotinib, and, and bosutinib. Um, I think that perhaps the next important aspect that I take in consideration for the selection is the expected toxicities, the comorbidities, and how each one of these may play um, for, for that particular patient. There's no direct comparison between these three drugs. And if you put the, the three studies side to side, the data looks very comparable. I mean, you can look at small differences and this and that, but considering that, they, that you're comparing different studies and it, it's very hard to make too much out of those small differences. So I think that the next, the next issue is, is this about the com comorbidities and the risk of uh, a given toxicity ba based on the patients. And, um, uh, and you have to discuss them with, with, the, with the patients, you know, wh you know how, how, how uh, sometimes for a patient's uh, lifestyle, a given adverse event, diarrhea, or, or fluid retention may be more meaningful than, than some others. Um, even some things that may not be a formal contraindication, you know, I, I don't think that a patient with diabetes shouldn't take nilotinib. You know, you can perfectly well treat a patient with diabetes. But if you have options, and, and if it's a patient that's had problems with, with control of the diabetes, well, maybe you, you can select something else. If somebody has, has a lot of pulmonary issues and, and whatever, um, again, I have treated patients with dasatinib, but, but, but if you have that option, well, maybe I would stay away from that initially and, and go with something that has less risk of fluid, you know, pleural uh, effusions and things like that. Um, somebody who has already problems with their bowel, serious bowel syndrome or something like that, well, you know, diarrhea may be a more of a, of a problem. So, so those things can help you make those decisions. I liked how you walked through those, but let me put you on the spot for, for one that, uh, that a lot of us are concerned about. To me, it, I think the data shows that the second generation able to AKIs uh, do have more cardiovascular risk in terms of arterial uh, uh, occlusive events than imatinib. Do you think there's a significant difference between the three second generation drugs? Do you use cardiovascular risk as a reason to choose between the second generation drugs or would you use imatinib in a patient with cardiovascular disease? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's something that we've, uh, it, t it took us a while to learn. You know, we, we didn't recognize that early on, but, but now we do. And, and it is very clear that there is an increased risk of arterial thrombotic events, arterial occlusive events with these, with these drugs. Um, I think that it is, it is a, it, it's, a, it's a common theme. Certainly with panatinib and nilotinib and dasatinib, you see higher risks compared to imatinib in these randomized studies. Uh, with bosutinib, there appears to be less of a risk. Um, 
Uh, I still think that imatinib probably has the lowest risk. Uh, but of the second generation, it appears that bosutinib has the lowest of the three. So I think that that's an important consideration. If you have a patient that has, it, it, and, and it's a risk factor, it, it's important to recognize. Uh, and, and just like you know, this Framingham scoring, it, it's, it's a number of risk factors that, that puts the patient at, at uh, risk of having heart attacks and things like that. So if it is a patient that already has a lot of risk factors, has um, hypercholesterolemia, and it's hypertensive, and it's diabetic, and smokes, and all these things, imagine it gives you the lowest risk of, of all these drugs. And, and that's why, yeah, we still use imatinib in some patients. That may be the safest thing. Do you lose something in terms of efficacy? You lose something, but, but, but it's an effective drug. So, you know, we, we, we shouldn't forget that it is an effective drug. And, 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 and what you gain in terms of safety may, may be justified. Um, if it is a patient that has very few risk factors, or maybe only one, and, and certainly if you can control, let's say, the hypertension, you can control it, maybe you have a little bit more flexibility uh, I may, if, I, if it's a patient that I really want to use a second generation, but I'm a little concerned, I may go with bosutinib on that patient. Uh, although still needs attention, and we need to be careful on managing all these comorbidities to, to minimize the risk. Yeah, I, I practice the exact same way. If I have a pa patient, especially older patients with significant cardiovascular risk factors and actual prior events, I'm going to go with imatinib as first line. So let's say I go with imatinib as first line and they're not meeting their milestones. Are you a believer in going up on the dose, or do you switch? No, I, I am a believer in going up in the dose in, in a given scenario. Um, certainly switching is, is better. There was this old uh, uh, study with the satiny where there was a randomized study of uh, the, the, uh, the start R was the name of that study, where the, the, these patients that were not responding well, the criteria for switching were different than the ones we use now, the, the criteria for failure and all of that. But, but still, uh, the, the, the point is that the patients were randomized to either switch to the satinib or increase the dose of imatinib, and switching was better. Um, but I do think that for a given patient where the risks are very high with the, with the switch, uh, increasing the dose can help some patients. So that could be a consideration for a patient like the one you're describing. 